A Phantom Coach by Amelia B. Edwards. The circumstances I am about to relate to have truth to recommend them. They happen to myself and my recollection of them is valid as if they had taken place only yesterday. Twenty years have, have gone by since that night. During those twenty years, I've told the story to but one other person. I tell it now for, with reluctance, which I find it difficult to overcome. All I entreat her, meanwhile, is that you abstain from forcing your own conclusion upon me. I want nothing explained away, and what there are no arguments. Mine are subjects quite made up. Having a testimony of my own senses to rely upon, I prefer to bide to wait. Well, it was just it was just twenty years ago, within a day or two, the end of the grouse season. I'd been out all day with my gun and had no sport to speak of. The wind was due east of Mount December the place, a bleak wide moor in the far north of England. I lost my way. It was not a pleasant place in which to lose one's way. The first feathery flakes of a coming snowstorm just flattened down under the heap on the heath, my leaden evening closing in all round. I stayed in my eyes with my hand and stared anxiously to the gathering darkness where the purple moor land melted into a range of low hills some ten or twenty miles distant. Not a faintest smoke weave, not the tiniest calculated patch of park fence or shape track met my eyes in any direction. Nothing for it but to walk on and take my chance, finding what shelter I could by the way. So I shouldered my gun again and pushed wearily forward. For I had been on foot since an hour after daybreak and eaten nothing since breakfast. Meanwhile, the snow began to come down with ominous steadiness. The wind fell. Of this, the cold became more intense. The night came rapidly up. As for me, my prospects darkened with a darkening sky. My heart grew heavy as I thought how my young wife was already watching for me through the window of our little inn parlour and thought of all the suffering in store of her, for, for her throughout this weary night. We buried four months, and we have spent our autumn in the highlands, in our lodging remote little village, situated just on the verge of the great English moorlands. We were very much in love and, of course, very happy. This morning, when we parted, she implored me to return before dusk. I promised her that I would. What I would have done, I would. <coughs> I, what would I not have given to keep my word? <coughs> <coughs> now, even now, free as I was, I felt with the supple. An hour's rest, a guide, I shall get back to her for midnight, if only the guide's shelter could be found. All this time the snow fell and the night thickened. I stopped and shouted every now and then, but my shout seemed only to make the silence deeper. A vague sense of eagerness come upon, came upon me, I began to remember stories of travellers who walked on and on into the falling snow until wearied out, if fain to lie down and sleep their lives away. Would it be possible, I asked myself, to keep on thus through all the long night, dark night? Would there not come a time when my limbs must fail, my illusion gave way? I too must sleep the death, sleep of death. Death, I shuddered, how hard to die just now. My life lay so, all so bright before me. How hard for my darling, whose only loving heart, but that, Thought was not to be borne. To banish it, I shouted again louder and longer, and listened eagerly. When my shout answered, or oh, had I not fancy I heard a far off cry? I heard it again, again. The shadow followed, then a raving speck of light came sunning out of the dark, shifting, disappearing, glowing, growing momentarily, momentarily nearer and brighter, running towards it at full speed. I found myself. To my great joy, face to face with an old man and lantern. Thank God for his explanation. 
that burst from voluntary from my lips. Blinking and frowning, he lifted his lantern, peered in my face. What for? cried he sulkily. Well, for I begin to fear I could be lost in the snow. Ah, then folks do get cast about you. Hereabouts it's far of coming time to time. And it's what to, what to hinder you. They've been cast away likewise. If the Lord's so minded, the Lord's so minded that you and I should be lost together, friend. We must submit, I replied. I don't mean to be lost without you. How far am I now from Dawoli? A guide twenty one, more or less. The news finished, the news finished, and he woke. And it's only twelve miles at east of his side. Where do you live then? Out yonder, said he, with a vague jerk of lantern. Going home, I presume? Maybe I am. Now I'm going with you. The old man shook his head, rubbed his nose reflectively with the handle of his lantern. Ain't no use, Grady. Ain't I'll not let you, not he. We see about that, I replied briskly. Who is he, the master? Who is the master? And now to you, was the unsummary reply. Well, well, you lead the way. I'll gauge that master shall give me shelter and supper tonight. Oh, you can't, you can try him, muttered my reluctant guide, and still shaking his head. He hold the gnome like away the falling snow. A large mass loomed up presently out of the darkness. Huge dog rushed out, barking furiously. Is this the house, I asked? Aye, this, it's the house of Bound Bay. He fumbled his pocket for the key. I drew so close behind him, prepared to lose no chance of entrance, and saw in a little circle of light shed by the lantern that the door was heavily studded by nails like the door of prison. Another minute, he had turned the key and pushed past him into the house. Once inside, I looked around with curiosity and found myself in a great raffled hall, which served apparently a variety of uses. One end was piled to the roof with corn like a crown. The other was stored with flower sacks, agricultural implements, casts, and all kinds of mis- miscellaneous lumber, while with, from the beams of a hung herd. Overhead hung rows of hands, flinch, flinches, and bunches of dried herbs for winter use. In the centre of the door, floor, so some hu- huge object going to grant gauntly dressed in a dingy wrapping cloth, and reaching far away to Ralphers. And lifted the corner of his cloth, I saw to my surprise a telescope, very considerable size, mounted on a rude, movable platform with four small wheels. The tube was made of painted wood, bound round and metal, bounds of metal rudely fashioned. The spectrum, so far as I could estimate its side, dim light, measures at least fifteen inches in diameter. While I was yet examining the instrument, and asking myself whether it was not the work of some self taught optician, a bell rang sharply. That's for you, said my guide, with malicious grin. Yonder's is his room. He pointed a low black door at the opposite of the hall. I crossed over and rapped somewhat louder and went in without waiting for an invitation. Huge white haired old man rose from a table, covered books and papers, and confronted me sternly. Who are you? he said he. Oh well, who? How come you here? What do you want? James Murphy, barrister in law, on foot. Cosmore, meat, drink, and sleep, bend his brushy drowse into potentious frown. Why is not a house of entertainment? he said, haughtily. Jacob, how dare you admit this stranger? I do not admit him, grumbled the old man. He followed me over the mire and showed it his way in before me. I had no match for six foot two. I pray, sir, by what right have you forced him an entrance to my house? Same by which I should have clung to your boat if I were drowning. A right for self preservation. Self preservation? There's an inch of snow on the ground already, I was that replied briefly. It'd be deep enough to cut my body before they went. Show to the window, pulled aside a heavy black curtain, looked at it's true, he said. You can stay, you choose till morning. Jacob served for supper. With this he waved me to sleep. 
resumed his own, came as not once absorbed in his studies on which I had disturbed him. I placed my gun in the corner, drew a chair to the heath, and examined its, my quarters at leisure, smaller and less incongruous in its arrangements than the hall. This room contained nevertheless much to awaken my curiosity. Curiosity, the floor was carpetless, the white washed walls were in part, were in part scrawled over it with strange diagrams, and others covered with shells crowned with physiological instruments. Uses of many of which was un, were known to me. One side of the fireplace stood a bookcase filled with dingy philos, and a small organ fantastically decorated with painted carvings of medieval saints and devils. Through the half open door covered at the further end of the room, I saw a large array of geological specimens, surgical preparations, cubicles, retorts, and jars of chemicals. On the main mantel shelf, beside me, a number of small objects stood a model of the solar system, small gunneric battery, and microscope. Each, every chair was at had its burn, every corner was hit high with books, very floor was littered over with maps, casts, papers, traces, and learned lumber of all conceivable kinds. I stared about me with amazement, increased by very f- by every fresh object upon which my eyes to chance to rest. The strange room had never seen it seemed it stranger still find such room in a lone farmhouse amid those wild and solitary moors. Over and again I looked for my host to his surroundings and from his surroundings back to my host. I observed who and what could he be? His head was singularly fine, it is more the head of a poet and philosopher, broad in temples potent, prominent over the eyes, and clothed with rough profusion of perfectly white hair. It had all the idility and much the ruggedness of characteristics of the head of Louis van Beethoven. There were deep lines about the mouth, same stern furrows in the brow, as the same concentration of expression. While I was yet observing him, the door opened, and Jacob brought the, in the supper. His master then closed his book, rose, and with more courtesy, a manner than he had yet shown, invited me to the table, a dish of ham and eggs, a loaf of brown bread and a bottle of mired sherry were placed before me. I have a homeless memory, this farmyard fare to offer you, sir, to my entertainer. I hope that you trust or make up for the deficiencies of our larder. I had already fallen upon the Velites, and now protested the refusal of starving sportsmen. I have never eaten such evics so delicious. I bowed stiffly, and sat down in his own added to his own supper, and consisted primarily of jug of milk basin and porridge. He yet in silence, when he had done, Drake could remove the train, and then drew up my chair to the fireside, host somewhat to my surprise the same. And turning abruptly towards me, said, Sir, I've lived with in here in strict retirement for three and twenty years. During the time I have not seen as so many as many strange faces I would have and I have not read a single newspaper. You're the first stranger who crossed my threshold for more than four years. You favour me with some words of information, reflecting of uh, out of the world from which I have parted company so long. Pray interrogate me, I replied. I'm heartily at your service. He bent his head in acknowledgement, leaned forward with his elbows resting on his knees, his chin supporting the palms of his hands, stared fixedly in the fire, and proceeded to question me. His queries related chiefly to scientific matters, the later progress of which applied, applied to the practical purpose of life, he was at moments, was almost wholly unacquainted. Those students of science myself were applied, well, my slight information permitted. The task was far from easy. I am much relieved when passing from interrogation discussion. He began pouring forth his own conclusions on the facts which had been attempted to place before him. He talked, I listened, spellbound. He talked to me, believed he almost forgot my presence. And he thought aloud, I never heard anything like that it then. I have never heard anything like it since. Within all the systems of philosophy, subtle, 
analysis, bold in generalization. He poured forth his thoughts in an interrupted stream, and still leaning forward in the same moody attitude. His eyes fixed upon the fire, wandered from topic to topic, from speculation to speculation, like a spy dreamer, from the practical science of the mental philosophy, from electricity and the wire to electricity and the nerve. Watts to Mesa, Mesa to Reichsberg, Reichsberg to Stockholm, Swinburg, Spinozzi, Kondalek, De Kentis, Berkeley, the Strasser, Strasser, Plato, the Magi, Mystics of the East, their transcendentations, which, however bewildering in their variety of scope, seemed easy and harmless upon his lips as sequences, sequences, music. By and by, I forgot how, by, now by what link of conjecture, of illusion, he passed, feel which lies beyond the boundary, lie in the most conjectural philosophy, and reaches no man whether, knows whither. He spoke with soul, its apparitions, the spirit, and its powers, a second sight philosophy, which for moment, those phenomena, which under names of ghosts, spectres, and unsupernatural appearances, had been denied by sceptics and attested by, by all credited of all ages. A well, he said, grows hourly more, a more sceptical of all that lies beyond its own narrow radius, a man of science fussed with fatal tendency. They condemn it fa as fable, all that was risk experiment, reject but false, all that cannot be brought to the very test of laboratory, dissected them. Almost that but superstition must have waged so long and a slow war as against the belief of apparitions. Yet what superstition maintained its hold on the minds of men so long and so firmly? So many facts in physics and history or archaeology were supported by testimony so wide and so various, arrested by all races of men all in all ages and all climates, so sober sagas, and particularly the rudest savage to the, of the day, by a Christian and pagan pantheist. The materialist of this phenomenon treats nursery tale by the philosophers of our century. Circumstantial evidence weighs with them as feather in the balance. Comparison causes with effects, however vulnerable in physical science, put aside as worthless and reliable. The evidence of competent witnesses, however conclusive in the court of justice, accounts for nothing. Who, he who pauses before he pronounces, condemns as a trifler, he who believes as a dreamer. Or fall. He spoke with bitterness, and having said thus, lapsed for several minutes into silence. Presently he raised his head from his hands and were added, with altered voice and ant manner, I, sir, pause and investigate, believe, as not the shame to state my convictions to the world. I too was branded as vidory, helped held by ridicule or my contemporaries, and who did from what field, that field of science in which I had laboured I nodded during all the best years of my life. These things happened just three and a half, twenty years ago. Since then, I've lived as you see me living now. A world has forgot me, as I have forgotten ten a world. You have my history. It's a very sad one at the moment, scarcely knowing what to answer. It's a very calm one, he replied. I've only suffered the truth, as many as better wise men suffer before me. He rose as if the devourous of ending the conversation, went over the window. His, his cease numbing his herbs. He drift, dropped the curtain, came back to fireside. Cease, exclaimed, startling eagerly to my feet. Oh, if I were only possible, but no, not, not hopeless. Even I could find my way across the mall. I could not walk 20 miles tonight. Walk 20 miles tonight, repeated my host. What are you thinking of, my wife? He said, I replied to him impatiently. My young wife, who does not know that I have lost my way, is at the moment of breaking her heart, suspense and terror. Where is she? Down the woodling. Twenty miles away. Down the woodling, he echoed thoughtfully. <coughs> it's a distance, it's true. Twenty-five, three foot miles. He's uh, so anxious to see the next six or eight hours. So very, very anxious. I should give them te you ten guineas at this moment for a guy in arms. Wish me gratified a lowly, less lonely course. Did he smiling? A night mail from the north, just which changes horses there when he passes in five miles. The spot it'd be due a certain crossfit road about half an hour and a half. 
Jacob would go with you across the moor, put you into the old coach road. You could find your way, I suppose, to where he joins the new one easily, gladly. He smiled again, rang the bell, gave the old servant its directions, taking a bottle of whiskey and wine glass from the cupboard in which he kept his chemicals and said, Said the mars, those lies deep and will be difficult walking tonight. The more glasses of Quichbo before you start. I would have declined the spirit. You pressed it on me. I drank it. I went round my throat like liquid flame. I almost took my breath away. It's strong, I said. said. It will help to keep out the cold. And now you have no moments to spare. Good night. I thank him for his hospitality. I have, would have shaken hands. He turned away before I could finish my sentence. In a minute, I transversed the hall, scraped and laid the upper door behind me. We were out on the wide, white, white moor. Although the wind had fallen, it was still bitterly cold. Not a star glimmered in the black vault overhead. No sound save the rapid crunching of snow beneath our feet disturbed the heavy stillness of night. Jacob, not well, pleased with his mission, scrambled. Sh- shambled on before and sullen silence his lantern his hand his shadow at his, at his feet he followed my, my gun over my shoulder never inclined of the conversations of himself my thoughts were full of my late hosts his voice that rang in my ears his eloquence yet held my imagination captive i remember to this day and was surprised how my brain retained whole senses and parts of senses troops of brilliant ideas images Fragments of splendid reasoning in every in very words in which he uttered them, musing thus over what I heard and striving to call a lost link here and there, strolled on up the hills my guide, dissolved him by servant. Presently at the end it seemed to me of only a few minutes he came to a sudden halt and said, Yon's your road, keep your stone fence to your right hand and you won't forget, won't fail to the way. And then, is the old coach road? It, then it, 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 is it the old coach road? Aye, it is the old coach road. Now far do I go before I reach the crossroads. Nine upon three miles, I pulled out my purse, came even more cumulative. Those fair, fair road enough, he says, for foot passengers that day it was all oh, steep and narrow. Northern traffic, you mind where the poor pits broke away. Close again the signal post. The event when mended since the accident. What accident? Ah, the nightmare pitched right over the valley below. A guide to two feet or more. Just as worse a road in the whole country. Horrible. How many lives lost? All. For all of them were found dead. The others to die next morning. How long is it since this happened? Just nine years. The end of a signpost, you say? I bear that in mind. Good night. Good night, sir. Thank you. Jacob pocketed his half crown, for made a faint pretense of touching his hat, and trudged back to the way he came. I watched the light of his lantern till it quite disappeared, and turned to pursue my low, my lay alone. To there was no longer matter of slightest difficulty, for beside a dead darkness overhead, the sign of stone fences showed there distinctly enough against the pale gleam of snow. How silent it was now, seeing now that only footsteps were listened to. How silent, how solitary, strange, and sense, agreeable, sense of loneliness stole over me. I walked fast, I hummed a fragment of a tune, cast enormous sums in my head, and accumulated them at compost interest. I did my best, in short, to forget the startling speculation which I'd just been listening, and to some extent I succeeded. Meanwhile, the night the air seemed to become colder and colder, and though I walked fast, I found it impossible to keep myself warm. My feet were like ice. The sensation in my hands had grasped my gun mechanically. I even breathed differently, as though, instead, transversing a quiet north, north country highway, I was scaling the utmost heights of some giant out. This last symptom became presently so distressing, I was forced to stop for a few minutes. I leaned against a stone fence. As I did so, I chanced to look back up the road. There, to my infinite relief, I saw a distant point of light, like the gleam of approaching lantern. I had first concluded that Jacob retreated his steps and followed me. 
that even at this conjuncture presented itself, second light flashed in the night, a light of being parallel with the first approaching that same rate of motion. Seeing no second thought to show me there must be carried lamps of some private vehicle, that it seems strange that any private vehicle should take a road professionally disused and dangerous. There should be no doubt, however, the fact the lamps grew larger and brighter every moment. I even fancy could already see the dark outline of the carriage be- between them. It's coming up very fast and quite noiselessly. The snow being nearly a foot deep on the wheels, and now the lamp body of the vehicle came distinctly visible behind the damps. It looked strangely lofty. Suddenly, so suspicion flashed upon me. Was it possible that I had passed across roads of a dark, observing the signposts? Could this be the very coach for which I came to meet? No one to ask, my, to ask myself that question. Second only for the here, it came round the bend. The road, a guard and drive, one outside passenger, four gleaming steaming greys, all wrapped in a swift haze of light, through which a lamp blazed out like a, a pair of what, fiery meteorites. Don't fall to wave my hat and shouted. Mail came down at full speed past me. A moment of fear that could not be seen or heard. But it was only for a moment the coach should have pulled up. The guard muffled to the eyes in capes and coffers, patty sound in sleep and rumble. Neither answered my wail, nor made the slightest effort to dismount. At a moment, Sai Pashina did not even turn his head. I opened the door for myself and looked in. There were but three travellers inside. So I stepped in, shut the door, slipped into the vacant corner, grabbed myself at my good fortune. That fear the coach seemed, if possible, colder than that of the coach's air. I pervaded of a singular, damp, and disagreeable smell. I looked round at my fellow passengers. They were all they were free, men and all silent. He did not seem to be asleep, but he even leaned back in his own corner of the vehicle, as if his all his own reflections, attempted to open the conversation. How intensely cold it is tonight, I said, just to my opposite neighbour. He lifted his head, looked at me, and made a reply. The winter, I added, seems to have begun in earnest. Although the corner in which he sat was so dim, I could distinguish none of his features very clearly, so that his eyes were still turned full upon me, and yet he answered never a word. At ever, any other time, I should have felt, perhaps expressed, some annoyance. But in a moment, I felt too ill to do either. Icy coldness at night air struck a chill of my very marrow. A strange smell inside the coach was affecting me, intolerable nausea. I shivered from hide to foot, and turning my hand, left hand neighbour, I asked if he had any objection to open window. He neither spoke nor stirred. I repeated the question somewhat more loudly, of that same result. Then I lost patience and sat, let the sash down. As he so, the leather strap broke my hand in my hand. Observed that the glass was covered with thick coat of mildew. Accumulation in its uh, plenty of years. Attention being thus drawn to the condition of the coach, serving it more narrowly, and saw by the uncertain light of the outer lamps that it was very st- last stage of depilation. Every part of it is not only out of pair, but in condition of decay. So she is splintered and at touch, leather fratings were crusted over with mould, literally rotting from the frame of woodwork. The floor was almost break, almost breaking away beneath my feet. The whole machine, in fact, was foul with damp, and then eventually been dragged for some outhouse, in which it had been mouldering away for years, to turn another day or two of duty on the road. Turned to third person, whom I had not yet addressed, and hastened, as it did one more remark to his coach, I said. In a plural condition, regular mail, I suppose is under repair. He moved his head slowly, looked at me in the face about well speaking a word. Never forget that look while they live. I turned cold a heart under it. I turned cold at heart even now, I call it. His eyes loaded with fiery and natural lustre. His face was livid as the face of a corpse. His bloodless lips were drawn back, as if an agony of death showed the gleaming teeth of the dream. The words I was about to utter died upon my lips. The strange horror, a dreadful horror, came upon me. My sight, by this time, became become used to the gloom of the coach. 
I could see the tolerable distinctness. I turned my opposite neighbour. He too was looking at me and saying the same startling pallor in his face, same stony glitter. His eyes as passed my hand, crossed my round. I turned on a passion to seat beside my own. Saw, oh heaven, how shall I describe what I saw? I saw there's no living man, and none of them were living men like myself. Pale, fluorescent light, a light of perfection. Played with it upon their awful faces, upon their hair, dank with dews of grain, upon the clothes, earth stained and dropping to pieces, upon their hands, which were as the hands of corpses long buried. Only their eyes, their terrible eyes, were living. Those eyes that were all turned menacingly upon me. A shriek of terror, a wild and scrutinial cry for help and mercy burst from my lips as I flung myself. Against the door and strove in disdain to open it. In a single brief and valid, valid a landscape beheld in the rash of a summer lightning, I saw the moon shining down through the wrath rift, a stormy cloud, a ghostly signpost, rearing its thorny finger by the wayside, a broken pallet, the plunging horses, black gulf below, and a coach reeled like a ship at sea, then came a mighty crash. Sense of crushing pain and darkness, seeing as if years had gone by when I woke one morning from a deep sleep, found my wife watching by myself. I would pass, I was seen that showed. I gave you in half a dozen words, tales she told me, with my tears of thanksgiving. I've fallen over precipice, close against the junction, the old coach road, and knew, and only saved from certain death by lightning upon a deep snowdrift, it was accumulated. At a foot of the rock beneath, in the snowdrift was discovered at daybreak. A couple of shepherds had carried me near a shelter, brought the surgeon to my aid. Surgeon found me in a state of raving delirium, and broken arm and compound fractured skull. Led it in my pocketbook, showed my name and dress. My wife was summoned to nurse me, and thanks to youth and a fine constitution, came out of danger at last. Placed my fall, I need scarcely say, precisely. That in which a fate frightful accident happened the North Mile nine years before. I never told my wife the fatally full events which I just related to you. I told the surgeon who attended me that he treated the whole adventure a mere dream, born of fever in my brain. We discussed the question over and over again, but he found that we could would discuss it. The temper no longer. Then we dropped it. Hours may form the conclusion they do please. I know that twenty years ago I was a fourth inside passenger in the phantom coach.